So far we've been talking about the nature of gods, theoi. We'll turn now to think more about what the Greeks call arete, which could be translated as human goodness or excellence, sometimes translated as virtue via the Latin virtus. With this word we come into the domain of the human, but the human as, in a way, as the Greeks conceive of it, is our best when we're striving to be the best we can be to realize our most genuine or authentic potentials. To explore this in a, a kind of grounded way in Greek literature, we're going to look at two different kinds of, of hero. Not hero quite in our sense, but hero in something approximating the Greek sense of uh, an extraordinary individual who in some way has a close relationship with immortality. We're going to start with the epic hero. This is the hero as the hero shows up in uh, Hesiod and in Hesiod's near contemporary, if indeed he was a living biographical person, Homer. Um, we'll see how the epic hero relates to Time or the quest for honor in, in their society and how they oppose hubris, this sort of overweening and arrogant trampling of the dignity of the weak or the gods or even themselves. We'll move from the epic hero to what we'll call for this purpose the polis hero, the hero of the community. This is a somewhat later development associated with the uh, particularly lyric poetry of the archaic period that is around the 6th century BC, 5th century BC, and here where before the hero searched for individual outstanding honor and glory in a way that made them hopefully a force for good in the world, in at least some cases, the emphasis is really falling this time on cooperation. We'll talk a little bit about why and what's changed, and then we'll try to wrap up our themes for this discussion with a philosophical look at the relevance for human freedom, and once more the theme of how appearance and reality are different already in myth in a way that supports the development in philosophy of a quest to find the reality beneath the appearances. That will bring us, finally, to the importance of immortality to the Greek hero. So first, the epic hero. To, to get a sense of the start here, we probably have to begin with the uh, imagined or real historical author of several poems that have had an incredibly profound influence on, on literature and art and religion. Uh, these are the poems attributed to Homer. Homer's name, Homeros, uh, might literally mean pledge or security or in a certain Greek dialect, the blind one. According to tradition, indeed, uh, Homer was blind. Uh, he lacked literal sight, but he had an extraordinary uh, second sight, if you like. He could see the stories that he told. This name is usually given to the poet of the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, named respectively for um, Ilias, that's Troy, um, in what would uh, today be Turkey, uh, and the Odyssey, that's Odysseus, one of the heroes of the Greeks who fought at Troy in return. These two poems are part of a great cyclic cycle of, um, of orally composed tales that surround the events of a war the Greeks fought at Troy in which they sought to sack the city. Um, which may actually have happened in some form in the Bronze Age, though it's unclear um, exactly what time period and events it would refer to. In addition to um, being traditionally the name of the poet of these, these two poems in that cyclic cycle, um, respectively describing the Battle of Troy and the hero's return, specifically the hero Odysseus's return, Homer's name is associated with a series of beautiful hymns to the Olympian gods, which are usually called the Homeric hymns. It's often questioned whether Homer was a person. Uh, this is sometimes called the Homeric question. We'll find equivalents later in the course when we get to the Socratic question. Uh, the Socratic question is not about whether Socrates was a person. He was, spoiler alert. But uh, rather it's about um, who Socrates was because different sources represent him quite differently. In the case of Homer though, we don't really have other sources telling us much about him at all. 
except for this later, significantly later biographical tradition. So in any case, um, this is a big question. In a way, it doesn't matter so much to us. If the name of the poet of one of these works wasn't Homer, it must have been something, and the only name that's come down to us is Homer. A more substantive question is whether the same poet composed the Iliad and the Odyssey, that's still debated. Um, if there is a single poet of either work, or both, this person probably lived in the 8th or 7th centuries BC. Uh, it's generally presumed that Homer was a man, although there have also been some interesting theories suggesting uh, from internal evidence in the poems that Homer might either have been or incorporated uh, formulaic material from uh, a woman who is also a bard or rhapsode. Homer sings in the rhapsode's epic verse, Dactylic Hexameter, this is the story we told about Hesiod before, long, short, short, long, short, short, six times, and then a new line. Main point to raise here is that it's an oral and formulaic and sometimes quite improvisational medium. He's often regarded as the first and greatest Greek poet, and with Hesiod is generally credited by later Greeks with establishing the conventions of myth, religion, and a great deal of, of culture and ritual. For our purposes here, we're going to focus on the hero of the Iliad. Hero now not necessarily quite in our sense, uh, Achilles, who's the central figure of the Iliad, um, particularly in his rage or anger, is not necessarily represented as uh, an altruistic person or a person with character traits that we today might be conditioned to think are particularly awesome, um, but in certain ways he does qualify as a Greek hero. And we won't use that word in quite its technical sense in this discussion, but we are going to talk a little bit about what makes him special. So we can hearken back to the story that Achilles was a child of Thetis and Peleus. Um, the goddess Thetis, you might remember, was the subject of a prophecy according to which uh, she would have a child greater than uh, the father of the child. And this was one reason why, although Zeus fell in love with Thetis, uh, nothing came of that relationship and she was married to a mortal which prevented another cycle of overthrow in the realm of the gods. Um, the very wedding of Thetis and Peleus, the mortal to whom she was married, uh, was also a kind of hinge point in this story, because it was at that wedding, according to one version of the tale, that the goddess of discord, Eris, was not invited and she sent a golden apple, uh, and the golden apple was inscribed to the fairest, and several gods reached for it, and there was a whole debate about which one was the fairest. A mortal person was brought in to help judge, and the person who won was Aphrodite. And Aphrodite won partly by promising Paris the judge, the hand of the most beautiful woman in the world in marriage. Turned out she was already married to somebody else, but that didn't matter so much for the purposes of Aphrodite, who later whisked Paris and his new wife off to Troy uh, with an entire Greek armada soon to follow to try to get her back. This is the story of the Trojan War and its sources in a nutshell. But let's come back to Achilles, whose parents' wedding was part of how that whole story got started. This is the very beginning of the Iliad in Greek, which of course we don't have to talk through here. Here's a translation in English. Uh, this is the Lattimore translation. Um, in this translation, you can see at the very beginning, the, the main topic is the anger of Achilles, his rage or frustration that leads to the accomplishment of the will of Zeus. And this is how the story begins at the very outset. It positions Achilles as the center of, of the poem in its traditional form, but also particularly this emotional response, this anger that he has. Um, which takes several forms in the poem, but as we'll see, is especially about his uh, loss of time or glory or honor. That sounds pretty petty, but it's particularly important to Achilles in a way that we'll see. It connects to immortality. A little bit more about the story. So here's a classical representation of Achilles and Hector, the champion of Troy in battle. Achilles is the Greek champion. Uh, this story is being told and retold. You'll see it in modern cinema with Brad Pitt as Achilles facing Eric Bana as Hector. It's kind of one of the sources of the, the big showdown between the, the hero and the nemesis at the end of so many Hollywood films. Um, but Achilles himself uh, is, is part of a broader play in the Iliad. He's part of the play of how the Greeks have come uh, to try to retrieve Helen, 
uh, from uh, Paris, who again was the mortal man who judged at the wedding, who Aphrodite uh, arranged uh, the source of the Trojan War for, we're told at the beginning for all these different divine reasons. Um, but if we just focus on uh, the sort of battles that Achilles fights with the help of the gods, uh, who are represented here significantly, um, Athena supporting Achilles, Apollo supporting Hector, they are kind of the real powers that are uh, driving the two heroes and motivating and facilitating their success. Um, there's a tragedy to Achilles' story, even though he wins this fight. Here's a, a kind of signal of that tragedy. Um, my mother, Thetis, Achilles is speaking here in Book Nine of the Iliad, the goddess of the silver feet tells me I carry two sorts of destiny toward the day of my death. Either if I stay here and fight beside the city of the Trojans, my return home is gone, but my glory, Cleos, shall be everlasting. But if I return home to the beloved land of my fathers, the excellence or the sort of shining beauty of my glory is gone, but there will be a long life left for me and my end in death will not come to me quickly. Uh, so Achilles faces a choice between a long and comfortable and easy life and a short but glorious life. He chooses the short but glorious life. He chooses this life because he's searching for immortality. For as we can see here, Kleos, glory, that is everlasting. And this is partly because, to sort of put it in a sort of um, maybe oversimplified form, but a, a, a clear articulation, um, the hero is depicted in Homer uh, is really oriented around glory or honor. They want to do what they will be praised and honored for. They want to avoid what they will be shamed for. Uh, they do not want to be at the bottom of the scale of honor or time. They want to be at the top or at least to have their due. With Achilles, this sort of search for honor takes on a new dimension, though, because of the prophecy that he will die young if he takes it yet he'll have this endless immortality because we'll still be speaking his name, as we are, in fact, today. So this is an aspect of the Homeric hero that we can, we can think about. And summing up so far, we've got the context of the war at Troy, some of the ways that Achilles' parentage is entwined with the origins of the war, uh, which we've only touched on briefly. There's a much bigger story to tell there. Um, some of the ways that it marks a transition between the divine and human phases of the Greek myth world, and especially here the way that Achilles as the hero represents this traditional Homeric era hero's quest for individual glory, but with this sort of special flavor that he wants to live forever. And maybe he does because we still speak his name. So far we're talking about a pretty selfish seeming kind of concept of the hero, and if you've read little of the Iliad, you might find that's a fair description of, uh, of the way Achilles is represented as well. But there's also more to how the Homeric and Hesiodic hero, the hero of this era of poetry, searches for time or for honor. Generally, the excellent person in these poems is the person who seeks honor individually and rejects hubris, which is the arrogant abuse of power. Uh, that certainly involves rejecting hubris against themselves. Boy, do they ever. Uh, so there's all kinds of examples throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey where heroes are motivated to rage and action and, and indeed extraordinary deeds by defending their honor. But they also are motivated to defend the honor of the gods. Uh, and it's important in, in that aspect of the story, both, for example, in the Odyssey and in Hesiod's works and days, that they defend those in need. That includes uh, suppliants, uh, those who come asking for help, and strangers. Stranger here can mean somebody coming to the city or the community who has nothing, who's poor, who's needy. Um, so the rejection of hubris and the protection of, of time, including the time of the gods, involves doing good by those who have less. Uh, so even in their search for individual time, heroes sometimes do things we would consider heroic. Odysseus's speech to the Cyclops, Polyphemus brings this out a little bit in Odyssey Book 9, when he says, Revere the gods. He's giving a speech, hoping Polyphemus won't eat him, which wouldn't be very, very nice. Um, we are supplicants to you, Hiketai. And Zeus, he delicately reminds the giant Cyclops, 
is the avenger of suppliants and strangers, the guest god who attends venerable strangers. Okay, look at this word that's translated avenger. Epitimator, literally the one who gives time, the one who gives honor, who ensures the honor due, the dignity due to those in need. Okay. Uh, this is particularly thematized in Hesiod. Uh, so Hesiod, for example, uh, is speaking to his brother Perses and says, it's your turn now, heed justice, DK. Don't feed hubris, this sort of uh, overweening arrogance. It's destructive to anybody, but even a, a really amazing person can't easily bear hubris, but is weighed down by her after meeting with disasters. The better way is to recognize that justice overpowers hubris. Takes a while, but once we get to the telos, the goal, we'll see justice is the way to go. So this is the kind of ethos or ethic we can see, I think, in a subtle way in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and in, in a very explicit way in Hesiod, though many would also argue that these poems all have very radically different um, ethoses represented in them. I want to give another example of, uh, of a hero with wonderful and immortal time and a particular influence on philosophy. Looking back to Achilles, Achilles is um, referred to by Socrates in his trial generations later um, after Homer as a kind of icon for all the ways Achilles is a, a challenging and difficult character um, of a fearlessness of death and the search for a higher kind of immortality. Um, this hero, Atalanta, is also taken up as a philosophical icon in a different and interesting way. Atalanta is uh, a hero who is rejected by her father who wanted only boys for children. Um, she's exposed in the wild as a baby, but she's suckled by a bear and raised by hunters. She lives in nature, emulates Artemis, you might remember as the goddess of the wild, avoids men completely. She's beautiful, she's brilliant in the stories, and she's incredibly fast. Uh, this is a great virtue for a Greek hero. Achilles is also represented as very speedy, swift of foot. Um, in addition to her brilliance in battle and sport, uh, she is uh, extremely effective in uh, slaying monsters. She kills the centaurs, Heleus and Roikus. Um, and in uh, sporting engagements, she wrestles with Peleus. You might remember him. That's Achilles' dad. And she wins. Um, this is a representation in Greek art of the 6th century of that, uh, that sport. When the monstrous Caledonian boar comes and all the heroes are gathered to fight it, she's the first one to draw its blood after several have been killed. Um, in some versions of her stories, there's uh, many suitors who want to marry Atalanta, uh, and if she outruns them, she kills them. Uh, there's also the story that um, because, in a way, uh, this doesn't take account of the power of Aphrodite, of love, uh, one suitor is able to succeed with the help of Aphrodite, but fails to thank her. The reason I wanted to raise this particular story is because Atalanta becomes uh, enormously uh, celebrated with, with Cleos, with Time, much as Achilles does, and is still remembered uh, hundreds of years uh, after the stories are first sung. And this is picked up by one of the, the most important women in philosophy in the 4th and 3rd century BC, who we'll talk about a little bit later, Hipparchia. Um, in one, uh, one text attributed to Hipparchia in the Greek anthology, she writes or sings this, I chose not the tasks of a rich-robed woman, but the courageous life of the cynic. This is a school of philosophy that lives out in the wild and critiques normal, normal social processes and conventions. Uh, with my wallet and, and fellow staff, together with a coarse cloak and a bed of hard ground, my name as a philosopher shall be greater than Atalanta, for wisdom is even better than running free in the mountains. So this is an example of how the example of Atalanta for this sort of immortality through, um, through honor and celebration can still inspire philosophers hundreds of years later who now see the pursuit of wisdom as analogous in a way to uh, the pursuit of excellence that Atalanta exemplifies. Another dimension to this, so um, in general, in the Homeric poems, the, uh, the gods are represented as the real causes of what goes on, even if human beings seem to be the causes. I mean, arrows are flying around the battlefield at Troy, spears are flung 
shields are splintered, people are... all kinds of things are going on. And you think it's because, well, these Greek warriors are throwing these spears and shooting these arrows and raising these shields. In reality, if you can see things as they actually are, if you can draw aside the mist or the cloud that conceals the gods on the battlefield from human beings, you'll see that in fact, gods are everywhere. Daimonic powers, as the Greeks call them, daimon as a sort of uh, divine agency, are ubiquitous. Uh, when an arrow is fired and doesn't quite reach the mark, Athena brushes it away or a goddess or god brushes it away as, as gently, Homer says, as a mother brushes a fly from the cheek of her child. That's why the arrow didn't hit. But normally you can't see that. There's an exception in the Iliad in Book 5 where Athena, uh, speaking to a Greek hero she favors, Diomedes, says she'll draw aside the mist, the aklus, that conceals divine action from human beings so he can see what's really happening. And she does. This facilitates a recognition of the distinction between causation as it appears and causation as it really is. In this case, well, it seems like Menelaus just blocked that spear thrust from Paris, but in fact, that wasn't quite it. Uh, the god was the one who set the spear aside. Diomedes can see that when the mist is drawn away. This, as distinct as it might seem from anything that uh, smacks of science or philosophy, is a really important source for, for later proto-scientific thought in the Greek pre-Socratics. So when Democritus, uh, one of the uh, originators of ancient atomism, the theory of particles, says, by convention there exists sweet, bitter, hot, cold color, but in reality there exist atoms in space. That is, all these ordinary experiences that are conventionally there appear to be, but in fact there's these invisible particles and relations that structure those ordinary experiences, he's drawing on a long tradition that goes all the way back to passages like that one, where the mist is drawn aside and you see the real divine action. Behind that is the idea that, that causation is set by the gods, so anyway, what's up with the story of human heroism? What do, what do we have to do then, uh, if the gods are really determining what's going on? Well, they're not, actually. So this isn't quite a complete determinism, as, as philosophers would say, where it's sort of a causally closed system and everything that's going to happen can be predicted from the present state of things. Um, Homer, if Homer it is, already in book one of the Odyssey, goes to great pains to emphasize that human freedom and responsibility is real. In fact, Zeus gives this epic speech, no pun intended, in uh, the first book of the Odyssey, saying, what's up with these humans who think that, you know, uh, the gods are just making this all up and they're not responsible? they're responsible. Um, this is also really important in, in Plato's thought. Uh, one of the lines from Plato's Republic Book 10 that we'll read later in uh, this conversation uh, over the many weeks to come is so associated with Plato by the ancient Greeks that we find it engraved on a bust of Plato shortly after his own life. The quote is that, Aitia, causation or responsibility, lies with the person who makes the choice. The god is not responsible, theos and itios. So there's this sort of strong emphasis on human freedom, even in a world where so much is determined by gods we cannot see. And that's one of the reasons that Greek philosophers come up with some arguments for um, the view that even in a world where there's uh, unseen, we might say today, sort of elemental scientific principles in play that humans do not control, even so, human freedom and responsibility must be committed to and is somehow of central importance. So we'll come to that a little later too. Um, when we get to the, the 5th century, to the classical period, we'll find this especially vividly uh, with the contrast between the world as it ordinarily appears to human foresight with the totally unknown world of, of inscrutable non-human powers, whether by that time we're talking about scientific principles or anthropomorphic deities or fortune, or something else. The whole field is divided, as this scholar, Francis MacDonald Cornford, puts it uh, in a book on Plato's cosmology, the Timaeus, uh, between nome, which is human foresight, purpose, and motive, and tuke, unforeseen non-human agencies. They determine the course of a series of events. We see this as well in historians like Thucydides, who describe the great war between the Spartans and Athenians, which the Athenians called the Peloponnesian War. Uh, so throughout hundreds of years of Greek history, we're going to see 
this is a really important distinction. Um, to, to sum up then, uh, when we think of heroism all the way back to this epic period, and that search for, for immortality through kleos, through fame uh, and glory of all kinds, um, we have to see that even though there is a deeper, real level of causation beyond what appears, and human beings operate at the level of appearances, it is possible to get access beyond appearance to reality, to those structuring principles. And that's part of the possibility of philosophy. And second, it is always possible to act freely. Okay, so all that's behind as well, this kind of human search for immortality. Who wants to live forever? Um, this is put by the, the lyric poet Pindar in this really um, eloquent line that connects in a way uh, arete, excellence, human goodness, and the radiance of Zeus. Creatures of the passing day, what is anyone? What is anyone not? Man is a shadow's dream, but when the radiance given of Zeus comes, there's a bright light upon men and life is sweet. What is this radiance? What is human goodness? What is it that shines deservedly through generations in immortality? Also, we might feel that there's something not entirely satisfactory about the idea of immortality as being a legend. After all, we don't just want to be remembered, we want to be forever. This comes up with Achilles as well in Homer, who, after he finds himself in Hades' world, uh, feels like he'd give anything to come back to the land of the living. So we'll also see this search for a deeper kind of immortality running through Greek thought. So last but not least in this part of our review, we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of hero who is associated not with the epic poems, but with the polis or the city. Uh, this is a concept of heroism or excellence that develops a little later after the epic poets we've been talking about. Um, and this image from the seventh century represents one of the reasons and some historians view for this development. Think of Achilles leaping out in the field of battle alone as the champion to face Hector in some of the passages we were looking at earlier. The important thing is that Achilles stands alone. He's the champion. After all, he's in search of Timae. But um, a few hundred years after Homer may have sung those verses, uh, things have changed. It's no longer aristocratic, individual, wealthy warrior champions who face off against each other on the field of battle while most of the army of the people of their communities holds back. Uh, if a war is fought or a battle is fought between Greek city-states in hundreds of years later in the archaic period here, it's going to be a clash of groups, uh, often um, proto-democratic societies where um, heavily armed infantry, anyone who can bear arms, is locked together arm by arm, like in rugby or American football, and when they clash, the main thing is not to break the line. So the last thing you want is somebody being an Achilles, literally, running out super fast out in front and doing a heroic thing by themselves. What you want most is for everybody to stick together, to work together. And you can kind of see this in the development of, of the ethics of heroism at the same time. Simonides, one of the poets of this period, sings, I praise and embrace everyone who willingly does nothing base, but with necessity, not even the gods fight. A man not too helpless suffices for me. He's talking about what a good or excellent person is for him. One who knows the justice that benefits the city, the polis. This means somebody who is going to support the community uh, in what they do, who has, in a way, social virtue. So as this is summed up, Simonides is actually criticizing the traditional definition of the excellent person from that epic representation or period, uh, where goodness and nobility um, uh, might be seen as depending on these kind of achievements of even honor that actually turn out to be too insecure to form a real basis for human excellence. Um, but Simonides has a sort of replacement for that, it's our teamwork, it's our cooperation, it's our working together for the sake of the polis. And that includes an acknowledgement of the fragility of life. This is brought out really artfully by Pindar, a contemporary. Some people pray for gold, he sings, others for limitless lands, but I pray to please my fellow citizens and then to cover my limbs in earth, having praised the praiseworthy and scattered reproof on the wicked. 
Excellence, that's arete again, soars upward like a tree fed on fresh dews, lifted among the wise and just toward the liquid upper air. The need for friends comes in many forms. Uh, it's most valued in times of trouble, but joy too craves to look on trusty support. So that's to say, um, we always need friends. We get by with a little help from our friends and our community, uh, the people around us. So this is a contrast with the epic hero who, who goes it alone and in their success achieves a kind of immortality and honor and glory. We're still concerned with immortality um, and with excellence, but here the excellence is social cooperation, is working together because, and it's not the only reason, it would be too reductive to say it's the only reason, but partly because when a city in the 7th, 6th, 5th century is defending itself, it's a matter of everybody working together, not an epic champion working alone. Uh, but we can also see this in so many other developments that are at the root of early Greek democracies, um, the root of uh, deliberative institutions where people argue and debate to form policy, for example. So this is an important shift. I would just flag that this interest in, in human immortality endures in all these forms in the role of the hero. So we've reviewed a little about the epic hero, the quest for individual Time, the opposition to hubris and Achilles and Atalanta as examples. We've looked at the polis hero who's interested in uh, collaboration, cooperation. We've looked at uh, some ideas in the epic poets about causation, including human freedom and the distinction between appearance and reality that will ground some later philosophical and scientific distinctions. And we've emphasized the importance of immortality throughout. No soy